everyone. Welcome to episode 177 of the Book Cougars, two middle-aged women on the hunt for a good read. I'm Emily. And I'm Chris. We're going to start off straight away with some thank yous that we have. Yes, we have some new patron supporters. Yeah, Kathy upped her patronage. Thank you, Kathy. Reminder to people, you can change how much you support the Cougars. You can go up, you can go down, you can pause, come back. It's very flexible. Totally. And then Anne from Washington is a new patron. Thank you, Anne. Thank you so much. Welcome to our Patreon community where we hope to do more in the coming months. Yes, indeed. You have joined and now you're automatically entered to win books in our monthly Patreon giveaways. This month, we are giving away Bright and Deadly Things by Lexi Elliott. That giveaway is on March 15th. And then we also got a lovely direct donation via check from Jolene, who always annually wins the award for the most beautiful stationery. Thank you, Jolene. Thank you so much, Jolene. We really appreciate you. So should we let listeners know what we're doing this episode? We've got a lot going on. We have a lot going on and we've already been sitting here talking for over an hour and we thought, oh, we better put the recorder on and start the episode (laughs) or else we'll both be hoarser than we are. So in this episode, we'll be talking about our current read along book, Parnassus on Wheels by Christopher Morley. Then towards the end of the episode, we're going to announce our next quarter read along. You have to be a little patient (laughs) and we're going to talk about a giveaway. And after we make that announcement, we have a fabulous interview with author Amy Tector Her new book, the second one in the Dominion Archives mystery series, Speak for the Dead, is coming out the day this episode drops, and we have a copy to give to one of our newsletter subscribers. Newsletter is free, easy to sign up, just go to bookcougars.com, and you're automatically entered to win all of the giveaways that we announce on the podcast here. Yes. Did you finish Speak for the Dead? I did. Okay, we've both read Speak for the Dead. So we'll be talking about that with Amy. So much fun. Great conversation. And that will be at the end of the episode. Yeah, so stay tuned for that. And right now we're going to jump into what you're currently reading. I am back from California. You're going to hear plenty of that. When I was in a bookstore with Aunt Ellen, I picked up this memoir called My Kitchen Wars by Betty Fusel. I mean, if you saw the cover, you would know why. Maybe we'll post this on social media. Oh my gosh, it is a friggin' awesome cover. I mean, look at the spine. The spine actually got my attention because it's really pretty. It's got white writing on a black spine with this beautiful kind of red edging. Yeah, Yeah, it's actually fruit. I thought it was floral too, but it's fruit. But then when you look at the cover, (laughs) it's this woman's face behind a fork. Like yeah. a super large fork. Oh my God. Yeah, so the fork is like really close up and she's behind it. So she almost looks like she's, I don't know, in hell or prison or something. <laughs> At war, perhaps, as the title <laughs> suggests. So I couldn't resist. I am embarrassed to admit that I've never heard of her. She has published 12 books. The most recent was another memoir that she published when she was 85. And I looked her up and she's in her 90s now. It's fabulous. So I just started it just a little bit. But I want to tell you part of the other reason I couldn't resist is the titles of the chapters are things like Annihilation by Pressure Cooker, <laughs> Blitzed by Bottle Caps and Screws, Invasion of the Warring Blenders. <laughs> so it's not really very food centric, at least not yet. There are definitely no recipes, but it is about her life in kitchens. Hmm. Yeah. Again, it's called My Kitchen Wars by Betty Fusel. That's so interesting. I never really thought about that, that you have food books, books about food, and then books about places where you make food or the tools that you use to make food or going hunting and gathering as you have been with the mushroom books. You know, that there are these subgenres within the larger genre. It's kind of cool. Very cool. Yeah. So what do you prefer? What kind of subgenre is your favorite? I always love a memoir that has some recipes, but I also am kind of impressed by people who are really engrossed in the food world and have put out cookbooks and then they have the gravitas, I guess, to publish a book that has nothing to do with recipes. I think that's pretty cool and that their life is interesting enough to talk about 
how they were exposed to food as a young person and what food meant in their family. So I think I do have a fascination with that. Mm -hmm. But I always like a recipe here and there. Yeah, (laughs) This one doesn't have any recipes. Very cool. Well, I kind of indulged myself a little bit. Earlier this semester, one of the books that I shared is this beautiful oversized book, The Dictionary of the Book, a glossary for book collectors, booksellers, librarians, and others by Sidney E. Berger. Now, this is a really wonderful book. I mean, it is a dictionary, so it has definitions galore of everything you can imagine about books, printing books, the history of books, things like illustrations, how illustrations are done, different techniques. So anything you can imagine about books is in this. And it's not a very old book. This first one was published in 2016, and I've been enjoying it so much. This is for my history of the book class. Each week we have a vocabulary quiz. We get a list from the professor of vocabulary terms to learn, and then we have an actual quiz, which is a lot of fun. So this book has 317 pages. Well, I was on Amazon the other day looking around and noticed that there is a new second edition of this book, and it is twice as large. Look wow, at that. it I'm, is. I'm just, it's the same size but the thickness is the thickness, twice yeah. as large. Yeah. So this one is 561 pages. So a lot more in this book. And I didn't get it at first. And then I thought I can't really justify the expense because it is over $100. And then finally, I just said, it's a birthday present to yourself, you know, <laughs> and I'm worth it. <laughs> So I have been enjoying this new version. It's what I'm currently reading. It feels good in your hand, too. Yeah, they're really beautiful. The covers actually remind me a little bit of that mushroom cookbook. They're kind of like cloth and lightweight. It's not exactly super heavy, but I wouldn't call it lightweight. Mm -hmm. The cover of the first edition had like a stack of books that were horizontal. And the second edition has four strips that are vertical in orientation. And the first strip is a nice leather binding. The second strip is a medieval manuscript looking text. The third is type for printing. And then the fourth is marbled paper. So they're really distinct looking from one another, but both really cool. We'll do some pictures for y'all and put them on the socials. Yeah. After I graduate, if I miss doing quizzes, maybe I can have a quiz club. <laughs> <laughs> a new segment. Totally. So again, that's the dictionary of the book by Sidney E. Berger, second edition. I'm also reading The Memory of Animals. This is a novel by Claire Fuller. It comes out on June 6th. Thank you to Tin House Books for sending me an early copy. This is about a pandemic. So I wasn't quite sure when I started, like, oh, too soon. But it's really grabbed me and is a page turner. The main protagonist, Nephi, is a marine biologist. And this pandemic comes and she signs up to be part of a vaccine trial where she actually goes in hospital and she's supposed to be there for three weeks. And they start giving her IV and shooting her up with things. And then the pandemic gets really out of control and almost seems like the outside world has turned into a dystopian situation. All of the medical people disappear and she's left there with just some of the other people who are participating in the trial. Wow. (laughs) So that's as far as I've gotten. I'm not very deep in, but boy, has it gotten my attention. I love Claire Fuller. She wrote the book Unsettled Ground, which was one of my top reads the year it came out, which was also nominated for the Women's Prize. The Memory of Animals, it has a really cool cover, and it's out June 6th. Yeesh, sounds creepy. Yeah. Is the government involved? I don't know. You know, infectious diseases and labs and people yeah. disappearing in dystopia it just makes me think of some of the novels I've read that are more the thriller type that... It's usually Mm -hmm. some government experiment gone bad. Not yet. (laughs) More to come. (laughs) Well, I'm also reading The Warden by Anthony Trollope. This book came out in 1855, and Trollope is known for writing big chunkster books. Think Dickens and Wilkie Collins, you know, those big Victorian tomes. 
But this book is a short one. I've always been interested in reading something by him. You know, the length kind of put me off a bit. But this one, it's 185 pages. So I thought this one is going to be manageable. So I'm jumping in. I am enjoying it. The first chapter was a bit slow, but I know enough from reading Bleak House by Dickens. The first chapter was a challenge for me. And then I got into it and it breezed. And then at some point I went back and I read that first chapter again. And it's like I understood so much more part of it from the context. But I also just was used to Dickens style. And I think the same thing here with Trollope. So Thomas, who used to podcast at The Reader's, said that this could be the gateway into Trollope. Ooh, you might be doing a year of Trollope, you mean? Yeah, we'll see. (laughs) We'll see. (laughs) But that was the warden. So, Emily, what have you just read? I read another Maggie O'Farrell. This is the one I happened upon in a little free library. It's called The Vanishing Act of Esme Lennox. This was my treat on my flight across to California. I read it from cover to cover. It's interesting, it has no chapters. So it was kind of the perfect book for that, because it felt like it needed to be read that way. It's reminiscent of The Awakening by Kate Chopin, and Charlotte Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper. I would also add The Mad Woman's Ball by Victoria Moss. Mm. Where I'm heading with that is someone who maybe has some mental health issues. So Esme and her sister Kitty are growing up together. The very first sentence says, let us begin with two girls at a dance. And then it goes about a paragraph down and it says, or perhaps not. And then they're like, Esme is four years old. And so the telling of the story bounces a lot back and forth in time and to different characters, yet there are no chapter breaks. Hmm. So I would describe it as in a certain way, time feels like you're looking at it through gauze. Mm. I understood everything. I was confused at the very beginning. For about the first three pages, I was like, oh, I don't know. And then it all began to make sense. It's about Esme's life and how she ended up spending more than 60 years in Caldstone, which is a mental institution. It also has sections with her sister, Kitty, who's older now and suffering from Alzheimer's. And the way Maggie O'Farrell handled that was when it was Kitty's point of view, she put these big M dashes in front of the paragraphs because her mind is really wandering again. It's kind of like this gauze of Alzheimer's. So I thought that was really fascinating. But it's a tough read as far as why did Esme end up in a mental institution? I'm not going to ruin that for you, listeners. (laughs) But what I am going to do... I'm learning that Maggie O'Farrell is the queen of epigraphs. So I'm going to read to you the epigraph at the beginning of the book. Much madness is divinest sense to a discerning eye. Much sense, the starkest madness, tis the majority. In this, as all prevail, assent and you are sane, demure and you're straight away dangerous and handled with a chain. Wow. Emily Dickinson. Mic drop. Yeah. I mean, when I read that, I was like, ooh, I'm in good hands. Yeah. <laughs> and then the other epigraph is, I couldn't have my happiness made out of a wrong and unfairness to somebody else. What sort of a life could we build on such foundations? Edith Wharton. Mm which is also a hint. And it's interesting how you just said that you went back with the trawl up and warden and went back to the first chapter, because I've been finding myself doing that lately with a lot of the things I'm reading. And I definitely did that with this. I closed the book, went right back to page one and was like, you know, I just want to read that opening few pages again. And of course, then it totally all made sense and even more sense. So I don't think that's ever a bad idea because I always feel a little lost in any novel that I first start. Mm -hmm. So another book in my Maggie O'Farrell-a-thon. Checking them off. The Vanishing Act of Esme Lennox. We just posted a video on Instagram of cute little chart I made myself of all the Maggie O'Farrells. So I know what to look for 
and I've put them by date and then I'm starting to mark them off as I read them. So I see five check marks. Yep. And so you, you listed them like in chronological order. Yeah. Except then at the bottom, I have her memoir and her children's book. So I have all the novels together and then her memoir. So I have six to go. Nice. Yeah. Good job. I like your chart too. It's nice and colorful. Thank you. I like playing with markers. Your wife, Laura, taught me about that. <laughs> <laughs> the other book I read was Once I Got to California. It was really funny because I've had this book as an arc on my Kindle forever. It's now out and Aunt Ellen had it sitting on her desk. And so I thought, oh, I'm just going to pick it up and read it as, you know, a nice good old fashioned book. And it's called Finley Donovan Jumps the Gun. This is the third book in the Finley Donovan series out from Minotaur, the same people who put out the Louise Penny books. It's by El Casamano. The opening scene of this book made me laugh so hard. Reminder, Finley is a single mom with two little kids. She's recently divorced and she lives with her nanny Vero. I have to say, I've never read a character like this. They're trying to handle these children and Vero's in school. And Finley is an author. So the book is very meta because she's always writing a book whilst you're reading this novel, which I find fun. But the opening scene, she's in Walmart or some store and her little toddler in diapers decides as she's going to the bathroom in a public restroom to make an escape go into the men's room and climb under the door into a stall with a strange man. <laughs> so Finley is trying to coax him out using Cheerios, crawling on a floor. I mean, I could totally relate to this situation. Going to the bathroom when you have young children is an event. Even if you're at home, it's just an event. So it was a hilarious start to the book. In this particular novel, Vero is in trouble. She had borrowed money and the mob is after her. Mm -hmm. And so they end up going to a citizen's police academy to learn about police procedures. It reminded me, Chris, of how when you moved here, you did a ride along with the Guilford police, right? Yeah, they have a citizen's academy here that I attended that was like a 12 or 14 week thing. And yeah, the ended with a ride along. So that was really cool. And if your community has one, I totally recommend doing it. Because for me, it was a good way to get to know the community a little bit more as a newbie in the area. But it also then just exposed me to all the different units. Yeah. So this one is different because they actually are staying, you know, sleeping over at this academy. So it gives them good cover to get away from the mob and also to learn, you know, how to shoot guns, etc. And for supposedly for Finley to be getting information to be putting in her next novel. So they're covering a lot of bases with it. <laughs> you know what? That's funny because I have to say during my time at our local academy situation, I asked about the archives because they have their own archives, the police department. And I asked if authors have ever accessed it. And she's like, yes, yes. <laughs> she's like, not too long ago, a local author came to look at the police records that, you know, they're public. Right. They're now, not like you know. active investigations right. yeah. or whatever. So, yeah. um, so that's fun to think about a character written by an author, obviously doing that. Yeah, it's very meta. I enjoyed it. And then Nick is a detective who's also Finley's love interest. And Finley's editor really wants her to write a steamy section of her novel, and she hasn't. So she needs to practice in order to be able to write the steamy section. So it's just pure delight and fun. It's not highbrow literature. I love the character. I really do. This was a fun next third installment in the series. Again, it's called Finley Donovan Jumps the Gun, and it is out now. Now, did Aunt Ellen read it already, or did she let you have first dibs? She let me have first dibs. Oh, but... I think she had read, like, the first page, and then I was like, ooh, my turn. Wow, that's love. Yes. <laughs> True love. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to talk now about Parnassus on Wheels by Christopher Morley, which was our read-along, our 24th read-along. Yes, in our theme, Books About Books, this one is definitely a book about books. We did good, Chris. Yeah, it was so much fun to start with this one. Being an older book, it was published in 1917. 
So it's kind of neat to start with an earlier novel in that way. And it's a small one, a short one, I should say. Christopher Morley, I mean, what did you think? I really enjoyed it. I didn't really go in with any expectations. I did think it might be maybe hard to read, you know, like written in some sort of old style language. And I didn't find it to be that at all. Right away, I was into it. I was surprised that it was funny. I was not expecting that at all. So funny. Yeah, Yeah. really funny. I mean, I was laughing right away. (laughs) Yes, yeah. Yeah, because Christopher Morley was 25 when he wrote it, which is something Robin, one of the folks who was at our Zoom discussion, talked about because it's such a fresh voice. And the main character, the point of view character, is a 39-year-old woman who refers to herself as old and fat. And, you know, old maid. I don't think you'd use the term old maid, but she's single, 39 in 1917. So she's living with her brother, who is a published author, and she's holding down the fort literally while he sometimes goes away traveling and also gets to sit and write. And she's feeding him and cleaning and keeping his life afloat. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because they, they moved to the farm. She was a governess, and they moved to this farm to live that kind of lifestyle. And he thinks of himself, I mean, there's a lot of literary jabs. So if you know American literary history, you'll have a fun time with it. And if you don't, you'll still have a fun time with it. There's just a different layer, I guess you could say. Um, But, you know, he's like this throw figure going out into the wilds or into the country. But there he is having basically a woman take care of him, all of his needs. And she's slightly bitter. So she starts doing things like burning his mail. So he doesn't know that he's getting communique from the publishing industry. (laughs) Yeah, she burns everything except the checks. Right. Because, you know, she's got some sense about that. But But yeah, yeah. so he makes it big. And so he's off doing tours and talks and lectures and then just going out to fill his well artistically, so to say, you know, finding other topics to write about while she's back tending to everything. And she's just kind of sick and tired of it. I'm not sure she knows how sick and tired of it she is, though. I mean, she definitely is annoyed by him, I feel like. And that's why she starts burning things and all of that. But then lo and behold, one day, a man pulls up with Parnassus on wheels. Yes, which is this old Well, old. I mean, it's 1917. It's a horse-drawn cart, a van that has Parnassus on the side of it. And he has a little dog with him. And he's looking to sell it. It's filled with books. Filled with books. He travels around the region selling books out of this van that is lined with shelves. And it has flaps that open up so people who are standing on the sidewalk or the road can view the books. And she decides instead of her brother buying it, she's going to buy it instead. Yes. And make a run for it. (laughs) Yes, because he says, you know, does so-and-so live here? And she's like, oh, (laughs) I'm going to buy it. Because she has her, quote, own money. And money becomes a real issue in this. And this, to me, was the interesting point uh, during the conversation that we had. Because, you know, we have listeners of all different ages and... Some people didn't understand that in 1917 and even up until the 60s, like women couldn't have their own financial independence, that men had to co-sign for bank accounts and apartments and what have you. So I guess we don't want to give too many spoilers, even though this is a read-along title. So we are having some spoilers here and there, knowing that history, women's history of the lack of opportunities and the lack of freedom that women had financially, as well as culturally, was really important. And I think some readers thought, oh, wow, okay, now that makes a bigger impact. Right. I mean, I was pretty surprised that she had her own money to begin with to make decisions about because I would have thought in that time period, she wouldn't have even had a bank account with money that she considered hers. But she did. It was egg money, right? It was from money from chickens. selling eggs. Yeah. yeah. But her brother could still control the decisions she made with her money. Yeah. Or at least try. For the longest time, I thought they had a real, you know, egalitarian relationship. And I think they did until 
something happens that is outside of the brother's control, which I think was a little frightening. What does happen that, you know, she takes off and he comes home to find her gone. I think that would be a little distressing for anyone, even in this day and age. Like, what? You just left with some dude you just met? Right. And he sold you this wagon filled with books. And was he taking advantage of you? Or did you do something that you wanted to do became a topic of debate? Right, exactly. The other thing that was a big topic of debate in our discussion was about fat shaming, and her referring to herself as fat, and other people referring to her as fat. And I have to say, I thought it was funny, not funny that she was fat, but funny that she wielded her fat in one scene in particular to save herself, which I thought was really funny. But upon reflection, as we talked about it, people had some other feelings about that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one listener thought, well, if that's what her brother's been saying to her and she's kind of isolated on this farm and doesn't know a lot of people. And then I was thinking about the magazines and things like all the women are thin and thinness has been such a thing in American culture for a long time that she doesn't have girlfriends to hang out and talk with about things. Maybe she did kind of take that on or maybe it's just as another listener said, kind of satirical, Mm -hmm. that there's so much humor in this book at different levels, that maybe that was just part of the humor of the book in a satiric kind of way. And then another listener, I think it was Sigrid pointed out that she was slightly offended because this is a man writing this novel from a woman's point of view and calling her fat. Right. So ugly. Yeah. yeah. Old, ugly and fat. That was a uh, Brooke who was talking about that, that it could be done satirically or at least maybe not sincerely mm-hmm. on her part. And that's, you know, that brought up some issues, too. Like some women couldn't imagine their brother saying those things. But I've known plenty of women who have brothers who can be pretty harsh and mean. Yeah. <laughs> but that's yeah. getting away from the story. Yes. But I mean, it's such such a charming story. And Helen just begins, that's the main character, she just really kind of blossoms and enjoys her freedom. And it's not even about the books for her necessarily, because so Roger is the name of the man who owns Parnassus or sells Helen Parnassus with the horse and the dog. And I love that Karen, whose handle is Barker for books, really into dogs, uh, asked, was anybody else offended that he just gave away his dog, you know, which led to a conversation about Did he do it for Helen's safety or was it love at first sight? And he knew that he wasn't really going to be leaving his dog or Parnassus or his horse. Who, what was the horse's name? Peg. Peg. Yeah. 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 It's a good question. But he's the real book lover. Yes. And 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 he can really sell, hand sell books, which is how he's been successful. Yeah. And he like progresses people, which I really like, which, you know, it's, kind of like an education theory too. Like you don't start new readers off with Shakespeare, you know, you kind of build people up, right? You don't want to overwhelm people with something that's challenging to understand, right? What he does, how his business model works, I guess I should say, is that he keeps going back and visiting the same people. So that's how he does that. He'll come around once and then he'll come around another time and they're now anxiously awaiting him and he's got something else for them and he knows what they like to read. It's the literally a bookseller that's hand selling to you. Right. And so while he's out there on the road, he's also acquiring books that he thinks about that so-and-so would like this one or what have you. But one of the funny things, too, is that there's a lot of kind of digs at the current book selling trends or the book trade, because one family, they've been struggling trying to read a set of books on funeral orations. So it was a traveling salesman who sold them this subscription, which were really popular back then, as we have like Book of the Month, which (laughs) Morley was actually involved at the beginning of Book of the Month. He's one of the first judges. But you know that they would sell these to people and it would come in the mail subscriptions, but funeral orations, right? like who the hell wants to read that at night by the fireplace day after day after day. But some people were kind of like, I don't want to buy another book. I still have all these funeral orations to get (laughs) through. (laughs) Poor things. I wanted to be like, let's make a fire out back. We can take care of those for you. Yeah. Well, one of the things I wanted to say, and I'm a little embarrassed to say this out loud, but you know, 
I feel like I can be vulnerable with Chris. It's a safe place. There were points in my reading where I really felt like I was reading nonfiction. Like I really thought this is a true story. This really happened. I, I love Helen and she calls him ginger snap, you know, and I just, I I had to kind of like wake myself up from this fog of thinking I was reading a real story. Yeah, I can totally see that. I mean, because it is so fresh. The voice and the writing, I think, is really fresh. And her desire as a woman to have a fulfilled life Mm -hmm. and thinking that at the age of 39, she was pretty much done with her life. But really, to me, one of the main themes of the novel is she had a whole new start at the age of 39. You know, she found, do we say, she found love? Yeah, 39. And and that they have a conversation. Uh, Roger says at one point, like, you know, history is full of people who got their start at 40 or later, which is wonderful. And I think that's one of the great things about books is that you do see people of all ages doing different things. Yeah. Yeah. And he teaches her how to hand sell books because she's obviously really well read. She's not on the surface as book crazy as he is, but I think she is. Well, I think she starts out in the novel as being annoyed by books because of her brother and his role (laughs) in the literary world, you know, and how in a certain way it's just causing her more stress and work. Right. And, you know, you get the sense that she likes to be in the kitchen. She likes her kitchen and her work. But she says at one point, tell me what American housewife can sit and read in the evenings. Right. They don't have that luxury. They don't have that time. Like even 15 minutes is rare. Yeah. I mean, when you think about 1915, like they were still using ice boxes, you know, like it was a different world. They had a lot to do. Every generation has their hardships. Yeah. I mean, some things are easier for us, but harder and vice versa. So I don't mean to imply anything by that. Just that it took her all day to do everything and to plan ahead as the the sole person running the, the kitchen there. I just realized, too, that thinking about Roger, when you said she calls him Ginger Snap. So he's like this short man. She's taller than him. Mm -hmm. And he's red haired and has whiskers and and stuff. So the way she talks about him is also kind of maybe dismissive and hurtful, potentially. I wonder if a a short red headed man reading the book would have a different perspective. Oh, I didn't see it that way. I thought it was just a really nice little... I mean, she doesn't like him at first, right? Because she's kind of annoyed that people love him so much and she wants to establish her own routines with Parnassus and sell the books and everyone's just waxing poetic about him and she kind of gets sick of it. She's sick of all these men getting all this attention, (laughs) basically, you know, and she's ready to like live her life, but things change for her. So I didn't see it that way. I thought that was, I mean, maybe at the beginning, I just think it changed. Yeah. Yeah. But we also wanted to talk about the title for any of you that are Ann Patchett fans Ann Patchett, the author, has a bookstore down in Nashville called Parnassus, Mm -hmm. and they have a traveling bookmobile called Parnassus on Wheels. They do. It's also painted blue, just like the Parnassus on Wheels in this novel. So a conversation started on our Zoom about Parnassus. In the chat. Yeah, and someone had been there, and I said that it's one of my dreams to go there. Actually, several people had already been to the bookstore. And one of my dreams to go there and go to Parnassus, but also to stalk Ann Patchett. Totally. Yes. So if you're wondering if her bookstore was named after this novel, the answer is yes. Yes. Well, and in Greek mythology, Parnassus is where the muses live, I think, Mm. going further back. So Linda says in the chat, she had written that she will never forget Ann Patchett on the Colbert Report. And I didn't catch that because I don't watch late night TV. So I tracked it down on YouTube and it was a really fun conversation. It was kind of short, but she really handled him so well. I totally recommend it. We'll get the link and put that in the show notes. So that kind of took me down an Anne rabbit hole on YouTube watching interviews with her. And there was a wonderful one with her and Reese Witherspoon in her bookstore in Parnassus in Nashville. And funnily enough, the place used to be a sun tanning studio (laughs) where Reese actually had gone as a teenager. (laughs) So that was kind of funny. So they're circle. Yeah, they're like much better use of the space here. (laughs) Yes. I mean, she's just such a great 
person, Mm -hmm. book lover, writer. I really am so happy we chose it. I'm glad people had so much to say about it because it's a short one, but Mm -hmm. it's so filled with neat book stuff, the relationship. We should also say the brother does track them down and there's some fisticuffs that happen, which is that made a lot of people laugh, you know, thinking about this little ginger snap guy and the literary brother fighting over her. It was a great read and such a fun conversation. I'm I'm glad we chose this one. Yeah, I'm really glad to have read it. It's probably just like happens with these things. Not one I would have picked up on my own and so glad that we did. Yeah, same. And the edition that we had from Dover also has the Haunted Bookshop in it. And some people have already read that one or they're planning on it. And I think I'm going to read it this summer. Yes, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah. So Parnassus on Wheels by Christopher Morley. And reminder that the conversation continues on our Goodreads thread. So anytime you read it, you're welcome to join the conversation there. We'll put a link in the show notes. This episode is sponsored by... The Last Beekeeper is a near future story about a beekeeper and his daughter, Sasha, as the world's pollinator population disappears. A decade after the Great Collapse, Sasha returns to her family's abandoned farm in search of information about her now incarcerated father's past. But instead of answers, she finds a group of squatters who welcome her into their family. Until Sasha sees an extinct bee, which could destabilize their family or it could save them all. The Last Beekeeper is available now by Julie Carrick Dalton. Biblio Adventures. Biblio Adventures. I had a great local Biblio Adventure at RJ Julia's in Madison. I went to see our buddy Will Schwalbe talk about his fresh off the press book, We Should Not Be Friends, The Story of a Friendship. Um, Linda, our librarian, drove all the way from Ohio to attend this event. She definitely wins the award that night for traveling the distance to get there. He had a lot of friends in the audience because he went to Yale. And this book is about a friend that he met while at Yale when they were both invited to become members of one of the secret societies. And this was a secret society that was invitation only, and they chose 15 students. I believe it was their junior year. It was junior or senior. I can't remember. And they tried to choose 15 of the most diversely different from each other students that they could. Hmm. And then the whole point was for you to spend time with these people and get to know them and become friends with them. This book tells the story of Will becoming friends with Maxie, who was this really dynamic athlete. Everybody loved. He was big personality. And Will at the time was studying literature and really into theater. And he just thought Maxie was basically the worst. And of all the people in this secret society, he was the one he avoided at all costs. And at one point, the group of them went somewhere. They went out of town a distance and Will needed a ride home. And the only available ride was to get on the back of Maxie's motorcycle. (laughs) So he did. And the rest is history that's in this book. And it is about how he never thought he would really become close friends with Maxie. And they've now had this really many year relationship together and they love each other dearly. The event was really sweet. He read just a little bit and then he told some fun stories. I'm really looking forward to digging into this book. One of the takeaways that Will really wanted everyone to leave the evening with was that people can become friends with a far greater range of people than we think. And what he's found is it usually has to do with a shared set of values. So you can be a very different kind of person person from each other, but you have to share some sort of values in order for your friendship to grow and for you to care deeply about each other. So again, the book is called We Should Not Be Friends, The Story of a Friendship by Will Schwalbe. That's so great you got to go. I'm I'm bummed I didn't get to go and see Will and Linda. Yeah, but. you were missed. Well, I did attend the Harry Beecher Stowe event, and 
Next door is the Catherine S. Day house. She was a great niece of Stowe. She's the one who is responsible for transitioning the house into a museum. And her home now is also part of the campus there. So this was an event interpreting LGBTQIA lives at museums, at house museums. And they had four different homes represented. So Catherine S. Day was an artist and a preservationist. The one that I was most interested in was Sarah Orne Jewett's home up in Maine, which I haven't visited yet, but it's definitely on my list. Her house is managed by Historic New England, which is a huge preservation organization with homes all over New England that they're actively preserving and interpreting for visitors. And Jewett's house originally was not focused on her, but in 2018, they refocused their interpretation of the house on Sarah Orne Jewett and also now on Annie Fields, her partner. Um, They were in the classic Boston marriage. So the conversation between these four experts and how they handled the interpretation at these various houses was just really interesting and eye-opening to see how the interpretation has transitioned over the decades. The Gibson House Museum in Boston, this is where Charles Hammond Gibson Jr. lived. And he was a gay man and a writer, and while he was still alive, was preserving his house and creating it for an eventual museum of the time period that he loved so much. And for years, visitors would come and do the tour, and there was always this under not really presented conversation. Well, was he? Wasn't he? You know, so now they make that a point that that is part of the tour because it's part of who he was. So really interesting conversation. I know they recorded it to be posted and we'll put a link in the show notes when that becomes available. So yeah, thanks to the Harriet Beecher Stowe house for really eye opening and interesting conversation. Yeah, I can't wait to get up there. We've had that on our list for a while. So we'll have to make that a spring John spring thing. Now, I can't wait to hear all about your trip out to California with Aunt Ellen. We had such a good time. Ellen is bilocated now. So many listeners know that when Chris and I go to New York, we often get to see Aunt Ellen. But she's now living also in Berkeley, California, where my cousin lives. So this trip was planned and we had five days and Ellen had a lot she wanted to show me. (laughs) So I took some good notes. So the first morning, we walked with Linda, who's another Book Cougars listener. Ellen and Linda met at one of our Zoom read-alongs. That's so cool. It's so cool. So they meet on Wednesdays and they take a walk. And the walk includes a lot of little free libraries because Berkeley is heavily laden with little free libraries. It's amazing. I mean, really unbelievable. Three of my highlights were one made out of Legos, which was so cool. There was one yard that had a bunch of dog sculptures, and then their little free libraries were shaped like dogs, which I have pictures of and will post. And then one was the tiniest little free library I've ever seen. It was so tiny. And then if you pulled a book out, they had put wallpaper in the back of books. So you think (laughs) there's another (laughs) layer of books, which was hilarious. Then we went to the main branch of the Berkeley Public Library, which has a little tiny Friends of the Library room where they sell books. And then uh, we went to Ellen's close library to where she is. And they have a tool lending library. Cool. Like an entire huge room with weed whackers and Vitamix blenders and KitchenAid mixers. And I mean, every tool you can imagine. I've never seen anything like it. And they had multiple, I mean, they probably had 10 weed whackers hanging. Anyway, very cool. They also have laptop lending kiosks, which I had never seen. And I saw that at both of the branches of the library I went to. We went to a moth story slam, which I've always wanted to go to. The theme was stakes. S-T-A-K-E-S, not the steaks you eat. (laughs) So like high steaks. It was really good. And now, of course, I want to find them. I know there's one in Boston and one in New York. So maybe we'll get 
to go on a Biblio adventure to a moth story slam together. Then we went to 10 <laughs> bookstores. We think there might be more bookstores in Berkeley than there are in New York City. <laughs> we haven't done the research, but it sure felt like it, I have to say. Ellen is working on filling out her Alice Hoffman collection. So we were definitely on the hunt to fill those out. And then I've been looking to fill out our read-along shelf because I've made the mistake of donating some of our read-alongs. I know, both of us. I think we get into these little frenzies every now and then where we quote declutter or mm-hmm. just weed our shelves and we weren't thinking yeah that and i also think several of them i got from the library yeah. especially our early ones like true grit and i think the cather and some of the others so i completed filling out our read-along bookshelf too which we're going to do some videos of that in the future but i'm going to quickly tell you what we visited half price books which is a chain this one was really great they had a lot of amazing backlist. I was thrilled to find a copy of Thirst by Amelie Notham, who's an author that I love, and it's hard to find her books. We went to Out of the Closet Thrift Store, which had tons of books, and they sort their books by color, (laughs) which I have never experienced. It is very hard to read the spines of books when books are sorted by color. I didn't know. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But how smart of them? Because it's so much easier for people to shelve them then. Mm. And then you try to organize that many books alphabetically or whatever. If you try it and it's not done well, customers get bitchy. Yeah. I mean, most thrift stores where I've gone, it's just they're up on shelves, you know, so it was it was beautiful, but frustrating. (laughs) And I did post a video of that on all social media platforms. So if you want to pipe in, people have opinions. That's all I'm going to say. And then we went to the Sleepy Cat, which was this tiny, beautiful, well-curated store. Really beautiful sunlight. Books, Inc., which has several locations throughout the Bay Area. And I happened upon a copy of Ex Libris by Anne Fadiman, Confessions of a Common Reader. I'm so excited to read this book. She wrote the book, The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down, which is one of my favorite books of all time. So super excited to read this. And then I have to say Books Inc. was right in downtown Berkeley near the restaurant Chez Panisse. So (laughs) I was looking around every corner for Samin Nosrat, the chef who wrote Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, because I thought for sure she must shop at Books Inc. (laughs) I didn't find her, but I'll go back. And then we went to Black Swan, which was a vintage bookstore where we picked up a copy of Carson McCullough's Heart is a Lonely Hunter. Owl and Company, another used bookstore that had these incredibly tall shelves. And it was kind of like that classic, very dark wood. And they had one of those beautiful, tall wooden library ladders. I just got shivers. Yes, I had my moment. I had a library ladder moment. I climbed it. It was really fun. We didn't get a picture. I'm sorry. (laughs) And then Pegasus Books is in what had to be like an old roller skating rink. So I got my, you know, like middle school vibe going when I walked in. But then they had this music that was like total like head banging music. And I thought I am not going to be able to shop in this store. But they changed it. We found a copy of Safira and the Slave Girl by Willa Cather, a beautiful copy to go on our read along shelf. And then Moe's books. I love Moe's. So you've been there. Oh, yeah. I did not know that four stories. It's gorgeous. I mean, well, when I lived in Reno, and I was in grad school, friends and I would take a drive over the mountains because I think it was only like about a three and a half hour drive, if I'm not mistaken. So we would go and do book shopping there in Berkeley. Such a great bookstore. Moe's is one I remember for sure. Yeah. And I bought some really beautiful cards at Moe's, but they had a great selection of books there as well. I actually think I got my copy of True Grit too by Charles Portis at that store. And then Spectator Books was one that was deceiving. Just from the street, it didn't look very big, but it was one of those that just kept going back and back with different rooms. And that one was used and new. And then last but certainly not least, I spent two solid hours browsing in the Friends of the Berkeley Public Library bookstore 
which Ellen works at. She volunteers there on Thursday morning. Go visit her. And it's huge. And it literally is a bookstore that they, you know, like how a lot of libraries have a little closet or a little room or even shelves as you first walk in. But this is a bookstore that they curate the books, they sell them, and the proceeds support programs for the public library. Very cool. Yeah, they had a nice, like, kids section yep. and really large. I mean, it, yeah. it was multiple rooms, wasn't it? I yeah, mean, um, it's, from the picture, I couldn't tell. Yeah, it's really one big room, but okay. they have it, you know, separated into subjects and everything and fiction and all really well done and new arrivals. Yeah, it was great. And that's where I got my copy of My Kitchen Wars. And I bought a really cool t shirt for Jim because oh, their cool. logo is nice. really cool. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. Yeah, they had like freestanding shelves. So mm-hmm. like they had that kind of like Barnes and Noble feel. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And really good light. And then they put carts out front. If you live in the Berkeley area, they put carts out front too that are free books and they're good books. I mean, they're not, you know, like messed up old books or something. They're just books that they have like a dot system. And if they've been around a certain amount of time, they move them on. That's cool. So. Yeah. Oh, neat. We had a great time. Lots of walking, lots of book storing, lots of carrying books in tote bags. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Aunt Ellen, for showing me a good time in California. And Linda, it was great to meet you. That's so fabulous. Yeah, really nice. Now, did Ellen buy a lot of books, too? Were there things? She did. She found some Alice Hoffman's. She's almost done filling out her collection. I think she has two to go. And she's also rebuilding her book Cougars read along shelf. So that's fun. The house she's living in has these beautiful built in shelves. So she's filling them up. That's so cool. Yeah. Nice. Do you have any upcoming jaunts, Chris? I don't really have anything on the books that I can say. I only have one. And that is Idra Novi is out starting her book tour for Take What You Need. And she's actually doing an Instagram live the day that this podcast drops, 2 p.m. Eastern time. I think when they do a, an Instagram live, it also just stays on the feed, doesn't it? I think for that bookstore. I'm not sure. I think it becomes a video that stays there. That's a little bit of a mystery to me. But this is via Golden Notebook Bookstore in Woodstock. So I'll put a link to their Instagram handle and hopefully people can find it. Also, she's just starting out. So I plan to try to find her somewhere else, maybe in person. She's also doing a couple of virtual events. Very cool. What about upcoming reads? I'm definitely going to read Ex Libris by Ann Fadiman. That is going home with me tonight. Nice. I'm really excited. How about you? Well, I have in my hands, Are You There, God? It's me, Margaret, by Judy Bloom. Oh, I love that book so much. I know. What a I, cool copy. Isn't it cool? So I, I got this because Colleen, our listener, and she's been on the show a couple times sharing her Biblio adventures. Colleen does an annual birthday buddy read, and this is her choice for this year. So later in March, we'll be getting together on a Zoom conversation with some of her friends And this copy, when I first saw it, I did not like it. So it has Judy Bloom at the top. And then underneath that, it looks like text, like, you know, texting on a message app. It says, are you there, God? Question. And then another quote bubble. It's me, comma, Margaret. And then to the left in the response, it's just dot, dot, dot. So I just think that that is so clever and so relatable to younger people today that I love the cover now too, even though I was resistant at first. When I go home, I'm going to get out my original. I have it on my shelf. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And I'll, I'll take a picture for you and we could do side by sides. I yeah. would love that. Cause I remember the copy I read was my friend Lori's. Lori was like, Oh my God, Chris, you have to read this book. And I don't know, we must've been in middle school or so. Yeah, so. that would be right, I think. Or yeah. maybe even a little younger. I don't know. I'm I'll see sure. what the date is on yeah. mine. Yeah. So I remember reading her copy and them talking about it. And I just thought, wow, they're talking about like having a period and stuff. It just <gasps> seems so radical yes, at the time. Shocking. Yeah. Yes. 
Well, what a great idea to have people read about a book and meet for your birthday. Mm -hmm. Not read about a book, read a book in common and meet and talk about it for your birthday. That sounds like my kind of birthday fun. Totally right. And I think this is the third year she's done it. Right on. Yeah. So Judy Bloom, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. If you haven't read it, we both highly recommend well, should we do it? Should we make our announcement about oh my our gosh. <laughs> our 25th read-along? We've been talking about so many things, I forgot that we are doing this. <laughs> so it's hard to decide. We're feeling a lot of pressure. We started in 1917. We decided we're going to do something a little bit contemporary for second quarter. Yeah, so the book that we're going with came out in 2021. So it's pretty fresh, but it is available in paperback now and audio. Drum roll. Readily available at libraries. It's The Reading List by Sarah Nisha Adams. I'm really excited about this book. Yeah, this is one that Emily found. I'm super excited about it. It's about a young girl and her grandfather. Yeah, and they bond over books. I saw just a very short snippet of an interview with Sarah, and she said she was very shy as a kid and used to go to her grandparents' house and had her nose buried in a book. And her grandfather broke the ice and started chatting with her about books. And that's how their relationship developed. So it's semi-autobiographical. It's a debut novel. Sarah is an editor and a writer from England. So super excited to read this book. Yeah, I am too. You know, I didn't know either of my grandfathers. They both passed away before Mm. I was born. So I know that they were both readers But, you know, having never met them, I'm hoping to live vicariously a little bit through this novel. So our Zoom read-along discussion is May 21st. So if you're interested in reading along with us and being part of the discussion, send an email to bookcougars at gmail.com. I'll put all of this in the show notes, including a link to our email. Chris and I will be discussing it on episode 183. And, of course, we're going to have a Goodreads thread where you can discuss as well. Yes, yes. Please join us. We'd love to have you. Yes. We have a giveaway right now. We have a copy of Speak for the Dead by Amy Tector, which we are going to give away to one lucky newsletter subscriber. This book is out today, the day this episode airs, March 14th. Coming up next is our conversation with Amy about this novel, amongst many other things. She is an archivist up in Canada. Fun conversation. Totally fun. And this is the second book in her Dominion Archives mystery series. It's her third novel. In like three years. And she explains that Yeah, when we're talking to her. Because I was looking at the dates of all of her books and I thought, something has to be wrong here. And she explains why all of her books came out so close together. Yeah. So enjoy. We're excited to talk with our favorite new to us Canadian author, Amy Tector. The second book in her Dominion Archives mystery series, Speak for the Dead, is coming out on March 14th. Last year, I enjoyed the first book in the series, The Fallest Things. Amy has worked in archives for 20 years, an experience that infuses her novels with a rich authenticity. Her debut standalone novel, The Honeybee Emeralds, was selected as CBC Ottawa's All in a Day November Book Club pick in 2022. Originally from Quebec's eastern townships, Amy spent many years living as an expat in Brussels and in The Hague, where she worked for the International Crime Tribunal for War Crimes in Yugoslavia. She now lives in Ottawa, Canada, with her daughter, dog, and husband. We're not sure if that order was for alliteration or some other type (laughs) of hierarchy, Uh, but we're here today to talk primarily about Amy's new novel, Speak for the Dead. But we also hope to hear about some of her archival finds, which include things like an elephant ear. Welcome, Amy. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Amy, could you give listeners just a little brief synopsis of the most recent Dominion Archive series book? It's a murder mystery set in a fictionalized Canadian National Archives in Ottawa. And the protagonist is sort of a 
world weary, a little bit sad, a coroner who is called out in the first pages, is called out to um, a death site at a specific building owned by the Dominion Archives where nitrate film is stored. And it's a kind of creepy old building. It's disused and kind of falling apart. And she is confronted with a young woman who has apparently killed herself. And Kate very quickly starts to have suspicions that the death wasn't, in fact, suicide. And despite the police not supporting her theories, starts to investigate on her own, working with people within the archives to untangle what has really happened to this young woman. And as with all my books, there is a historical element, some parts of the past impinge on the present and sort of contribute to the death. And so there has to be always a little bit of delving into history in order to figure out what's going on in the present. I'm going to do something that's talk to authors 101 that you're not supposed to ask. <laughs> so I'm just going to go ahead and ask it as the first question. We've been told that authors hate the question, how much of this novel is autobiographical or are you actually one of the characters in this book? But since you're an archivist, it seems fair to ask how much of these Dominion Archive series novels are based with your own experience versus the research that you do to bring them to life? Well, first of all, I don't hate any question that anybody wants to ask me about my books. I'm so always so thrilled to talk about them and so delighted that anybody has any interest. So I, I don't subscribe to that Authors 101 uh, theory. I think it's a fair question. What infuses both these Dominion Archives mysteries, and a third one will be coming out next year, is this love I have and interest I have in history, but more specifically in archives and how archives kind of bring you into history. The Foulest Things, which is the first book in the Dominion Archives mystery series, focused on a different protagonist, a young archivist just starting out in her career. And I wrote that one many years ago when I was closer to being a young archivist, just starting out in her career. And so I think that character of Jess was is close to my heart or of who I was at 20, whatever, mumble, mumble, uh, when, when I was starting <laughs> my career. This character, Kate, she's a coroner. So I don't have direct personal experience as a coroner, but my sister is a doctor and a coroner here in Ottawa. So I have plumbed her knowledge uh, extensively to feed that. And Kate in this novel, in Speak for the Dead, is wrestling with a lot of grief, which I've certainly experienced. And she's a bit crustier and meaner, which I'm generally more of a sunny person, but it's fun to play on that <laughs> crusty mean side as well. I have it. I don't ex get to express it as often. So <laughs> yeah, both are there, I think. <laughs> I Easier to explore it on the page than in real life yeah. because of their reactions, yeah. Yeah. right? <laughs> awesome. Well, that's a good segue to that. I did want to ask about what it was like to write this character, Kate, who obviously very good at doing her job, but she's also really struggling with realities and some grief that occurred in her own life. And seemingly the way that I felt like the character read, she thinks she has her life together a lot more than the people she works with who are, you know, trying to help her, but also say to her, you know, this personal stuff is bleeding into your work life. Yeah. What was that like to write? I really enjoyed it because I think like at the heart, Kate's, her grief, which is discussed very early on, is that her brother uh, before the novel starts has died unexpectedly. Um, and and he, she was really close to him and she wasn't close to many other people, any other people really, because of life circumstances has really become a real loner. And she doesn't have connections at the start of the book. Or she doesn't think she does. And it's a really sad, tough position to not have those connections, right? In my mind, relationship is what life is about, connecting out with other people. And so I enjoyed exploring what that was like to not have that. And then to try to, over the course of the book, through solving this mystery, she is forced to connect out with some people in ways that she normally wouldn't. And to me, those are little tendrils of hope and tendrils of human connection that are coming out. So I hope the book has hope there through that, because I think that is the key to happiness, really, is that's it. It's not even meditation. It's being in relationship, even if it's with a dog, but feeling connected to other living things is probably the most important thing. And and I started Kate out very much isolated and wanted her to move to more connection, maybe not a ton, but at least a bit of openness and more of that by the end of the book. 
Yeah, so important to have that. Like you said, even just some other living creature. Yeah. Like really, yeah, yeah. So, you know, a lot of going back to the archives a little bit, I think most of our listeners are very familiar with libraries and understand how libraries work. Can you talk a little bit about archives and how they differ from libraries? And maybe what kind of reactions have you had to readers about your novels, which are set in archives? Like, do you get questions where you know, people think, well, that's not how it works in the library. Well, to start with the second part of that, I haven't had those kinds of questions because I think the people so far who have been attracted to these books are people who at least have an interest in archives and they know that it's something, even if they don't quite know what it is, because archives really are not well understood in popular culture. You know, everybody knows the Shushing Library and everyone has used a library, even if it's the school library, what have you. So we all know what a library is and how it works. And archives get lumped in there with libraries, which is a wonderful place to be. I love, love, love libraries. But the reason that an archives exists is different. And what's the central difference between an archives and a library is that a library contains published material, material that has been deliberately created so that other people can find it and read it. And whether that's a scientific textbook or a amazing murder mystery set in the archives. Um, it's, it's, written, it's written with that <laughs> deliberate goal that somebody else is going to read this thing. And that makes it easier to categorize and keep track of. And there's hopefully more than one of these, one of this publication in existence. So it's worthwhile taking a little bit of time and thinking about, okay, this book is about the anatomy of snails. And this book is about uh, you know, a, a pirate romance. And so they can be categorized. So it's easier to find it when you're looking for snail information. You can just do a quick search and find all the books about snails. And when you want a steamy pirate romance, you can do the same thing. And we all understand that that's how books work. Um, archives are what is created almost by happenstance in the course of creating history. So whether it is a government department that is creating uh, in Canada, we're really wrestling with our history of sending Indigenous children to what were called Indian residential schools, forcibly removing children from their homes and, and sending them to other institutions. And that went on for a very long time in Canada. And in the course of doing that, both the churches and the government who were responsible created enormous amounts of records. There was a ton of bureaucracy around these actions. And so Nobody was creating roles of children and who attended and when a child was sick and sent to the infirmary because they thought historians are going to be really interested in this in 100 years or 50 years even. That is what's happened. And because those records exist, we can now learn so much more about this period of history and what exactly happened. But it was incidental to their creation. They're not created on purpose. They're the happenstance. So they become a really rich source then for historians and other people, uh, you know, people seeking redress or, you know, authors seeking inspiration. It becomes a really rich source of research because you can go back and see what was created almost accidentally and you get a more unbiased reflection of what really quote unquote happened. Of course, it's like there's layers of issues around that, but it's not from someone's point of view. It's the archives are created in service of something else. And it's the same then with private archives or manuscripts that can also be created. So again, all of us have our own archives, which is our emails, our text messages that we send, the voicemails that we leave, the photos that we take. Really, our phones are now our personal archives. But if somebody was really interested in who I was and I was gone, they would look to all this information that I'd created, none of it deliberately because I wanted to be, I wanted it out there in the world, but incidental to me living my life. And they would get my opinions on steamy pirate romances and <laughs> you know, the latest political scandal or whatever. It's all, it's all there. And so on, a, on the personal side or the private side, it's, it's a really nice way to get a glimpse of somebody. So biographers are very interested in, in the archives that personal people that are created by individuals. And then the last thing I'll say about archives, because I can talk about it forever, um, <laughs> is just that, look at Chris. Chris is so I, excited. I'm like, yeah, keep it, keep on. Yeah. <laughs> um, is that they're unique. So unlike a book where, you know, there can be a thousand copies of a book out there in the world, there's probably only one copy of Emily Dickinson's handwritten manuscripts where she's scratched out lines as she's working through her poem. There's only one of those. And that's the nature of archives is that they're unique. 
which means that they're often harder to find. You can't just sort of put in a keyword and necessarily find the information that you're looking for. It takes more research to access archives. They're usually not the first stop when you're researching a subject. You don't first go to the archives. You do a lot of other research first and then you turn to the primary sources that are stored in the archive. Wow, that was great. I mean, <laughs> yes. what is it? I, I have to say, you know, until Chris started to go to library school and started to talk about archives so much, I was very naive about what an archive was. So I know a little bit more, you know, living vicariously through her now. But one of the things I really loved about the novel is you would take something like Chris used to say, finding aid, <laughs> finding aid. And I was like, I have no idea what she's talking about. <laughs> but in your book, you said, you know, finding aid, which is like a table of contents yeah, in a book. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> but anyway, I loved that part of the book because you would take what could potentially be kind of inside baseball terms and help people understand. And one of the key yeah. things that are talked about in this book are nitrite films, yeah, nitrite, right? Yeah. Can yes. you talk to just a little bit about what that is and why it was such an important part of this novel without spoilers? Well, and I'm so now excited because now I'm really going to deep dive nerd out. <laughs> <laughs> For a few years, I was a photo archivist and again at Canada's National Archives, and I was in charge of a project to move our nitrate film collection from an abandoned, scary building on the edge of a military base to a brand new, beautiful, purpose-built facility that it's now all housed in beautifully. So that really, if you've even read a couple of pages of the book, that really is the direct inspiration for Speak for the Dead. And I didn't know anything about nitrate film when I started, and I realized it's this amazing medium. So from about the 1900s to about the 1950s, it was the primary thing that photographs and uh, movies were, were put on. It was the primary medium for film. That's the kind of film it was made out of nitrate. And it's a really amazing medium because it captures, unlike anything else that we've had, it captures the image in incredible detail. So it's this extremely high quality in some respects medium to capture image on either moving image or still image the problem is that it deteriorates and this they sort of figured out and that's eventually why it was phased out because when it deteriorates well first of all it deteriorates so it, it's no longer usable and eventually the images evaporate so that's terrible from an archival point of view but more pressing is that as the nitrate film is deteriorating, it off gases. And those off gases are extremely volatile and extremely combustible so that they can literally spontaneously combust. If they're stored in an environment that's too hot, for instance, they will just start burning. And then once that starts, they produce their own oxygen. The film produces its own oxygen, so you can't put it out. So it becomes extremely dangerous Storing old nitrate is a really dangerous hobby because um, it can just blow and then just burn and burn and burn and it just feeds itself. So it has all kinds of very difficult challenges from an archival point of view. And there have been these famous nitrate fires. There was one in Canada with the National Film Board where we lost huge chunks of our heritage because there was a terrible fire and in like films like i think it's in glorious bastards where there's um, a scene in the in the movie theater and then there's a terrible fire that starts because that film is on nitrate film i think uh, cinema paradiso might have a nitrate fire as well so it's a it was a common thing back in the day and now of course they've created safety film which is called safety film because it didn't spontaneously combust but the quality is much worse it's not nearly as good oh. as that nitrate so Anyway, I, I find it really interesting. We have, I'm going to sidebar and you can cut this if you want, but at the National Archives, we have these amazing First World War panorama photos. So the soldiers, before they set off for the First World War, the special photographers would travel around the country taking photos of the units, of all the people, all the men standing before the building, before they went overseas, a lot of them to die, with these special panorama cameras that would sort of move slowly and get the panorama image of the full 60 men, what have you, who are about to go overseas. And the nitrate film, what we what we did was we're trying to digitize those so that we can we have an image of them and then prevent them deteriorating. But if they do deteriorate, we at least have the digital version. But when you digitize those at a high resolution, you can actually zoom in, zoom in, zoom in to such a degree that you can see 
somebody's name tag. You can see a freckle on someone's face because the quality is so high. So even though there are these enormous photos, you can zoom right in, which is really exciting. That's amazing. Yeah. And then that's one of the reasons why theaters built the projection rooms became almost like bunkers back in the day because of that flammability and that you can't put it out, which is just so amazing. You can Google that, like you can find videos on YouTube of people experimenting yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah. Quite scary. I volunteered at an archives and the archivist found a reel of nitrate film and, you know, basically like a unit came in with hazmat and they donated it to the Library of Congress yeah. where they have appropriate storage facilities for that type of material. Yeah, like it's a the new facility that was built a few years ago. It is a bunker. If the apocalypse comes, that's where I'm headed to uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's giant thick cement walls and it's way off in the middle of a field far away from anything else so wow yeah yeah get a little clay mold of that key yeah. and you have it <laughs> in a special <laughs> drawer <laughs> <laughs> well this is a question i don't think we've asked an author before but um tell us about your dog <laughs> Oh, Daffodil. She's just a little Cocker Spaniel poodle mix. She's uh, She likes to snooze and chase bunnies and she never catches what them. A cute. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that's, that's good for the bunnies. Yeah. <laughs> so we call them cockapoos. Yes. Yes. Do you up there calling it? Okay. Yes. Did I? Yeah, I cock- sometimes I say cockadoodle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, think it's funny. Well, I think I've invented yeah, that. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's cute. Yeah. One of our dogs and I as a kid was a cockapoo. Mm-hmm. But Love dogs. And I know a lot of our listeners are big dog fans. Yes. Well, so am I. <laughs> Amy, one of the things about your novels is that you really had a different path to publishing. It's a bit of a weird one, which has resulted in me having three books published in a 12 month period. So I'm just catching my breath because like you said, the Speak for the Dead comes out March 14th and that will mark one year of me putting out three <laughs> three novels. I've been writing since I was a little girl, reading, you know, as first I was a reader, then I was a writer, always writing and you know, in my 20s, started writing novels and hooked up with this amazing critique group that I've been with for the past 20 years, who just, you know, so creatively fulfilling and uh, supportive. And yeah, so I wrote a bunch of novels. And every time I would finish one, I would think this is amazing. I you know, like I feel really good about it. And then I would try to traditionally publish it. So I would do the, you know, the sending to agents, getting requests for full manuscripts. This was in the olden days before email. So I was printing out packages and putting them in the mail, all the rest of it with the stamped self-addressed envelopes so that they would send me my rejection. Like, <laughs> masochistic. So, um, I was, Did you do like a yellow envelope for rejection? Oh, and a blue envelope for, no. <laughs> like the IRS, oh use this label for rejection, you know, like oh, if you owe. It was so tricky because so many of them were in the States and I'm in Canada. So then I'd have to figure out the international postage. Like it was kids these days. They don't realize how good they got it because that was it was hard anyway <laughs> just logistically it was hard yeah so I so I did that you know and then I was unsuccessful despite some you know close calls and some big hopes I didn't publish anything so I decided to try a different tra- tact I'd written a few mysteries and I thought I'm going to try to write something different and see if I can find a spot so I I wrote The Honeybee Emeralds, which it is still a mystery, but not a murder mystery. And it's a sort of a lighthearted story set in Paris amongst expat community. And it's about four women who find a beautiful necklace and then they have to track down its owners. They have to go to some archives, <laughs> do a little bit of research. But they also go to vineyards and they also go to fancy jewelry stores and they eat a lot of croissants. And so that was a ton of fun to write. And I thought, as I do with all my books. I was like, this is a really good book. I'm going to find success with this one. And so I spent about a year querying agents. Again, had a lot of interest, but the publishing world is tough to crack. So I didn't succeed in finding an agent and thought, okay, I'll now start um, going to publishers, not the big five, but the smaller publishers who accept unagented submissions. And so I had just started doing that. And I had a list of publishers that I had vetted to make sure because there's some scammy publishers out there. And so I, you know, had <laughs> had the publishers that I wanted. And Turner, who's uh, Turner Keylight, who are based in Nashville, was one of the first ones I queried. And they got back to me right away. And I had the dream call with the acquiring editor at the time who 
was like, I love this book. I stayed up all night reading it. You know, we desperately want, like it was everything you could possibly want to hear. I got off the phone after talking to her and said to my husband, even if nothing happens with this book, I'm happy because I had a conversation with someone who's read my book, loved my book and isn't related to me. Like <laughs> that in <laughs> itself was amazing. So anyway, <laughs> so Turner, Turner said, yes, they're going to publish Honey Bee Emeralds, which came out last March. And then I said to them, well, I've got a couple of other books that I have written in the past of like my many attempts at publishing. I had two mysteries that I was really proud of and thought were really strong, but they just hadn't hit. And they said, okay, send us both of those. So I sent them both mysteries thinking that they'd be interested in one. And they turned around and said, actually, we like both of them. <laughs> you suddenly got a three book deal. So Honey Bee Emeralds is the latest book that I've written. It was the first to be published. Foulest Things was an earlier book that I had written many years ago, and it was published in September. And then Speak for the Dead, I had probably written about five years ago. So they've been published not in the order that I wrote them in, but they're all now out there in the world, which is beyond thrilling. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah. Is it confusing to talk about them since you wrote them so long ago or was because of the editing process, are they more familiar in your brain? Well, the editing process helped because it was so nice to like revisit these with smart people, you know, who had read them as well and were giving me good critical feedback that I could incorporate. And so they are more fresh, certainly like, yeah. <laughs> But it, it's yeah. confusing just because of this long, involved story I have to tell about the publishing process. <laughs> so right. that's that's yeah. the hard part to talk about. Yeah. Well, that's wow. funny because when I was looking them up, I was like, this doesn't, something's wrong because the dates are all close together. <laughs> so now it's good to have the explanation behind yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and well, like it's... I said, and then during this past year, I also wrote a new book, another book in the Dominion Archive. So there will be a fourth book, third in the series coming out, but not till next year. So I'm like, there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Give a little, everybody a bit of reading room because I'm not doing a book launch or anything for Speak for the Dead because I'm like, I can't ask my family and friends to come out again on a Tuesday night and drink warm white wine and like celebrate me when I've done it. They've already done it twice. In this year, so skipping it. Oh, man, that's, that's great. great. So, so much has changed for you then in this last year. And one of the things that I saw was a picture of you sitting on stage with one of the reigning queens of crime and mystery fiction, Louise Penny. Yeah. What was that experience like for you as a newly published writer of mysteries and historical fiction? Uh, well, it was amazing and a dream come true. And all the things you can possibly imagine. She is wonderfully beautiful in real life and tall and she had these fabulous boots and I was just <laughs> she had like a star aura she's so smart she used to be a journalist so she's really good at having those conversations and engaging with people so it was really wonderful and then she was interviewing me it was for this literary festival where we both are from the eastern townships of Quebec which is this well it's it's where she sets her three pines novels and I grew up there so that was the connection that kind of facilitated all of that because the, the festival had asked me to come as a debut author Louise is, they call her their fairy godmother for the festival. And so she happened to be there at that time. And so we, we were able to do that event, but it was thrilling. She's, she's a really smart, very kind person. So it was really fun. That's great. Yeah. Cause, I, and she has some library and archive action and some of her novels yeah. as well. Yeah. So yeah, I thought you guys were a good, good match for that. Yeah. 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 We had, we had a nice conversation. It was really great. By any chance, is there a video of that available online? I can check when I'm doing the show notes. There isn't, you know, there isn't, okay. unfortunately. Too bad. Yeah, I, I, I do regret it, actually, because, boy, that would be yeah. nice to have. <laughs> well, next time. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. right. <laughs> next time. Yeah. Wow. So I, I also wanted to just say something about the title. When I first started reading Speak for the Dead, I was like, that is like, what is this book going to be about? So I thought I would just let listeners know that I'm just going to read it from the book. The Ontario coroner's motto is we speak for the dead to protect the living. I thought that was so cool. Did you think that that would be the title of the novel all along? No, initially I had a sort of a whole bit where Kate is really listening to a lot of her mom's old records and there's a lot of Leonard Cohen. And so I had, um, I think it's who by fire. That's a great song. 
But then I learned how difficult it was to get copyright permission and how expensive. And so <laughs> I had to adjust, but then Speak for the Dead was so great. And that it is the, the Coroner's Association uh, motto was, was super helpful. The Coroner's Association probably doesn't charge a high fee. For you to use their motto. I didn't even ask them, so <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll edit that part out now. <laughs> if we're allowed to ask questions about the third Dominion novel, the first was with Jess, a young archivist just starting out. The second here was Kate, who is not an archivist, but it's dealing with an archival setting. Is there anything you can tell us at this time? about the third yeah the third follows kate because i do leave it on a bit of a i don't know if it's a cliffhanger but there's a bit there's some unresolved business at the end of speak for the dead so i knew i had to tidy that up so we follow kate my publisher was like oh, what are you doing amy because this novel the next novel which is tentatively titled honor the dead goes actually to the eastern townships because i've been wanting to write about the townships for a long time so kate finds herself in the eastern townships solving a murder there but my publisher was like it's called the dominion archives series so now you're not even in the dominion archives but it's okay because she's still doing archival work there are lots of connections back to that other novel i kept trying to bring it back to ottawa and to the dominion archives i had whole chapters where that where action happened in ottawa and it didn't work and so I had to cut it eventually because that's not the story that I wanted to tell, I guess. I couldn't I couldn't make it work. So, yeah, so it's going to be it's more it will be more rural. It's kind of my love letter to the Eastern Townships. And um, but there's still lots of uh, history connections. There's actually a sort of like a legend. It's based on historical fact that there's a figure, a historical figure called the Megantic Outlaw in the townships that I used to hear about when I was growing up. And so that story of this person who's on the run and hiding from the cops and getting into mischief um, is is incorporated into the next novel. Oh, cool. Well, can't wait. <laughs> and that's 2024. 2024, yeah. Okay. Wow. Nice. Yeah. You might go down in history as like having the most novels published in the shortest period of time. <laughs> well, now I'm done for a little while. <laughs> I'm <Yeah. catching> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I mean, this has been great. I mean, we so appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. Oh, I've loved it. This has been so much fun. Our listeners love mystery series and it's always fun to get in on the start. Yes. So, so yeah. glad to have discovered the Dominion Archive series. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Before you sign off, we want to remind you about some books that are out now that we've talked about on prior episodes. Pineapple Street by Jenny Jackson. Hello, Beautiful by Anne Napolitano. Take What You Need by Idra Novi, and All That Is Mine I Carry With Me by William Landy, which actually I forgot to talk about. <laughs> I read that one so long ago and just felt like I read it way too far in advance. And then I totally forgot to talk to all of you about it. He is the author of Defending Jacob. He was a Booktopia author with that book. He was at one of the Booktopias. I really enjoyed this novel. Look it up, read about it, and get it into your hands. All That Is Mine I Carry With Me by William Landy. Thanks for listening to The Book Cougars with Chris Wallach and Emily Fine. We'll be back again with another episode in two weeks. Until then, come chat with us on social media, Goodreads, or email us at bookcougars at gmail.com. If you'd like to help support our podcast, Please tell others about us, leave a review wherever you listen, and consider becoming a patron. Even a dollar a month is a big help. Learn more about that on our website, bookcougars.com, where you'll find the show notes for this and all of our past episodes. Thanks, everybody. This episode was edited by Pat Keogh Sound Design.